Hi everyone, welcome to Watch It Play Table Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith. And in this video, I'm going to wrap up my gamma experience by answering your questions about the show. If your question doesn't come up here, it probably means I just couldn't find an answer. David Montgomery writes, what were your three most exciting gamma game related moments? Well, in no particular order, I would have to include demoing Forbidden Stars with Tom, Richard, and Mark. That was a lot of fun. It was also neat to discover that the designers of Star Realms have a new game coming out called Epic, I think. Some of the details were fuzzy around the game. They weren't sharing a whole lot, although you could demo the game. I didn't get a demo in. It's a fantasy setting. It shares some similarities to Star Realms, but clearly it's a different game with a little more meat on the bones, it appeared. And I would say it was a real treat to be able to see the final artwork for Ashes, the card combat game coming from Plat Hat Games and designer Isaac Vega. And it was just really nice to hang out with Isaac and talk about games and non-gaming things. You know, Gamma was uh, a bit of a blur. There was a lot going on there. It was quite busy. And probably it was those moments away from the gaming and maybe even from the games, which present some of the best memories, to be honest. Uh, it was great to be able to go one evening, the Dice Tower crew invited me to join them, and that was Tom and Z and Eric and Mark, and we went to supper and we went to see Penn and Teller, and they were just a great crew to hang with, you know, and, and to get away from the madness of the trade show for a little bit and just do something like that. It was a lot of fun and, and very memorable. Andre Azevedo writes, any news about Arcadia Quest from Cool Men You're Not? Well, nothing specifically from Gamma, but a source at Cool Me You're Not does say that it'll be an exciting year for Arcadia Quest fans. Megan Naxer wrote, I was super excited to see your tweet about the Portal game from Valve and Cryptozoic. And when I say Portal game, I don't mean Portal Games Publishing, but the game called Portal, which is based on the popular video game series. Any news or details you can share? Thanks. Megan, I was asked about this quite a bit, especially after I posted a, a Twitter picture of the game, and I got all kinds of great information from Cryptozoic, and then promptly forgot it because I didn't record that conversation. So I went back to them and they gave me a bunch of printed details, which I'm just gonna read out because that's easier than me trying to memorize and then regurgitate it for you. With a grinding of gears and some uneasy rumbling, Aperture Laboratories has resumed testing. Your team of test subjects have entered the lab and are ready to perform all sorts of important, dignified, and dangerous testing procedures, all in the pursuit of cake. It's a fun and funny, fast-paced fight to the finish. And by finish, we mean your team probably died. The lab is an ever-changing conveyor belt of death and dismemberment, but scientific progress must be at the forefront of the mind of every good test subject. In this game of constantly shifting area control and card play, players move and portal their test subjects to various chambers in the lab. At the end of each player's turn, one of the chambers on the end of the lab gives way, plunging all test subjects on it into oblivion. <laughs> but should your test subjects have numbered greatest than all others in the falling chamber, they earn you some wonderful parting gifts, which can include cake. Yet these moist slices of industrial grade cake must be stored in the lab where they are at risk of falling into said oblivion. Not to mention that your jealous opponents can pick up your cake and move it closer to that precipice. He who has acquired the most cake when a team has lost its last test subject is the winner. So do you risk gathering cake early for a quick win or do you bide your time and wait until you can protect it better? So this probably gives you more of a sense of the theme of the game rather than specific mechanics, but there you go. People may also be interested to note that although Valve is partnering with Cryptozoic, Valve, the people behind the video game, are doing a lot of the development of the game in-house. Moto 573 asks, how is attending an industry-focused convention different to a consumer-focused one like Gen Con? This is an interesting question, and I'm not sure I can do the answer justice because the fact that you don't have direct sales to customers at this event just has kind of a passive impact on everything. You know, you think about Gen Con and the hordes of people rushing to and fro, trying to buy and grab up things. It creates a certain kind of frenzy and feeling to the whole show, which just doesn't exist at a trade show like this. Let me see if I can be more specific. First of all, there's less people there overall. So when you're talking to a publisher or 
designer or retailer or distributor or whoever, there's just there's less people crowding around you. So you feel like you can have a slightly more meaningful exchange and you're not soaking up tons of their time that they need to be spending with, with customers. Um, although I'm saying there isn't direct sales to customers, there's certainly sales going on in a manner of speaking. Retailers are considering, you know, is this a game that I should pick up for my store? How many copies should I have? They're talking to distributors. They're trying to find out about organized play and organized play kits and that sort of thing. And one other thing that's really kind of different about the feeling of the show is when you might be at Gen Con or BGG Con, when you're in those convention centers or hotels, you feel like that's what everyone's there to do, right? Like everyone you run into is another gamer. In Las Vegas, in the lobby of the hotel we were in, you're dropping the bucket. The majority of people are there are gambling, they're there in Las Vegas for other things. You can walk around and, and run into all kinds of people who are not gamers or there specifically for that event. So that's kind of just an interesting difference that I noticed while I was there. Starling UK asks, are you going to Essen this year? Well, unless someone wants to sponsor the trip, probably not. That, that would probably be a little more than the Watch It Played budget could absorb at this time, but I would love to attend that show at some point. Seems like it would be a really interesting and different show to take in compared to all of the North American ones that I've attended. We'll see, maybe some year. Pete Sheary writes, okay, top 10 questions for Rodney's trip to Gamma. 10 questions, Pete. Come on, that's too many. I'm cutting you back and I'm making my answers short. Is Forbidden Stars going to eat a hole in my wallet? Yes. Did you enjoy yourself enough to want to go back? Yes. Did you gamble and if so, how much did you lose? I probably put about $5 in the slot machines. I lost it all. Gambling doesn't appeal to me. Number four, what game left the most lasting impression on you after the show? Probably Forbidden Stars and Ashes. Do you think I'm cute? Say yes or no. I think you're being cute with that question. Could you take Vassal one-on-one -on -one in Forbidden Stars? Maybe? I'd certainly like to try. Number seven, what was the craziest thing you saw in Vegas at Gamma or otherwise? Okay, otherwise, like is it my whole lifetime? I'm gonna keep this restricted to Gamma. We went on a roller coaster, that was fun, me and my, my friends, but probably the coolest thing we saw, there was this hotel that was shaped perfectly like a pyramid. From the outside, it just looked like a perfect pyramid of glass, but inside, the inner part of the pyramid is just this open cavity, shops and different things in there in the, in the lobby. And the rooms ring the outside edge of the pyramid, but they're all on the inside of the pyramid, right? Because outside, perfectly flat. Inside would be like the room would run along the inside here. And then outside of your room, there's a, I guess like a hallway that then has a balcony which faces the inside of this cavity. So as you go up higher and higher and higher, of course, you're able to look down even further. What was interesting, first of all, when we got in there was like, well, wait a second, how do you get up to these rooms? Where's the elevator? Because it wasn't in the center of the pyramid where you might expect it to be. I guess the elevators, they look like elevators when you get in them on the corners of the pyramid, but they must have been like trams or something because when you get in them and they get going, you kind of feel yourself swaying to the side, right? Because it's kind of climbing up the side of the pyramid. And then when you get out off the elevator and in this balcony area, which is the hallways leading to the different rooms, it really is something else when you look over the edge. Not only are you up really high, but there's just something about knowing there's nothing directly beneath you. In an apartment building, everything's stacked on top of itself, right? So each of the balconies, there's a balcony beneath it. You always have this sense of comfort, like if this balcony went <laughs> fell away, hey, I'd, I'd fall into the balcony beneath me. But there is no balcony beneath you because they're all offset, right? Each level of the pyramid going inside. Anyway, it's, it's hard to explain. I got some images on the screen there that you would have seen. It was, it was freaky, it was freaky. And, and probably one of the most exciting things I did while I was there. Number eight, did you get to see Richard's Defenders of the Last Stand, and if so, thoughts? Okay, this is the last question I'm answering of your 10. Um, I did get to see the game and talk to Richard and um, Jason of Eighth Summit, who's publishing it. And it looked really cool. Once again, that was more of a conversation I just had casually with them. So I went back afterwards and I said, listen, I'm getting asked about the game. Can you give me some details? So let me just read this out for you. Defenders of the Last Stand is a post-apocalypse game designed by Richard Launius, the designer of Arkham Horror, which is set in the distant future after the world has been through a nuclear war. You are in the last city and there are four invading clans trying to enter. If a clan leader enters the city, the players lose the game, but you must weaken them through card play and conducting adventures before you battle them directly. 
They've developed a great deal of story that is established through adventures and mutation decks. You can also build walls and fortifications around your city to hold off invaders. Uh, this has been a huge project apparently and it will go live in May or June on Kickstarter, but with the current convention schedule it's possible uh, that the publisher said it might get delayed until uh, July. So May, June or July expect it to possibly go live on Kickstarter. Mark Cook had a couple of questions. One he asked, did I see anything that I think could be a Spiel de Jaris nominee? That'd be hard for me to assess, honestly, Mark. I didn't play a lot of games while I was there. I was more seeing things demonstrated a little bit. So, you know, I don't feel like I experienced enough to really give an award to any game that I saw there. Number two, did I get the impression that as the industry grows, it's more about the big companies, or do I think that there's still room for the small independent publisher? I definitely think there's still room for the independent publisher, but perhaps the big challenge now is that the quality of games is so high, consumers expect the same level of quality whether you're a big company or a small company. And I don't just mean in terms of game design, but just also the production and component quality. And being able to do that can be difficult for a smaller independent publisher just getting started. So that's certainly one of the challenges. The Angel of Dice wrote, quick question, out of all the people that you interviewed, what publisher managed to impress you the most with their pitch? Also, did you get a chance to chill out and play demos? Because I was working the whole event, I really didn't get a chance to sit down and just relax and play games. I did do a demo of Forbidden Stars and spit it out. And in a couple of the videos, I got to kind of do sort of partial demos of games. As it relates to the publisher with the best pitch, if you're ever at a convention or show, and Anton Tours of Fantasy Flight Games is there. Just, if you can, grab a seat at one of his demos or just watch and observe him give a demo. One of the best in the business. Engaging, thoughtful, knowledgeable, patient, great presentation style. I love watching him give a demo. Uh, I find he's just one of the best in the business. Matthew Bryson writes, was there any word on more copies of Dead of Winter from Plat Hat Game? Well, by now, Plat Hat Games would have received the most recent shipment of the game and would be fulfilling back orders. And then within two weeks at the time of this recording, stores should be receiving them for putting them out into retail where you can buy them as well. Matthew Bryson also wrote, what do you think about Tom Vassell calling you a jerk? I cackled with delight when I saw that video. If you missed it, here's what Matthew's talking about. I'll show you the quick clip. We played with Rodney for him watch you played, and even him and I this morning are smack talking about it. So it's been, it was just a blast. <laughs> Rodney Smith is a jerk. <laughs> just wanted to point that out. Of course, Tom was saying this in jest, and he followed up this topic in one of his live shows. I'll share that little clip as well. Rodney Smith is a jerk because he destroyed my forces in Forgotten Stars, which is actually just me joking around because Rodney Smith is one of the nicest people in existence. But I love playing games with him because we both get into it. And when we played for Forbidden Stars, we had like a, we had two back-to-back stand-up battles, right? Where we stood up, rolling dice, ah! And who wins each one of them, you know, and we're fighting. And at the end, it didn't matter who won each one. We shook hands because it was such a great battle. That is the best kind of opponent. One who really gets into it, trash talks the whole way, but as soon as it's over, doesn't care who won or lost. I mean, you, you care like, oh, yeah, I won or, oh, I lost, but it doesn't, doesn't go any farther than that. Love that. Rodney Smith is a great guy. Well, I appreciate Tom saying that. It was very nice. Uh, we do have a good rapport when we game together, but I don't think that's necessarily specific to me. I just think Tom games in an energetic and whimsical way, and that's fun to be around. And if you like that kind of gamer like I do, then it's going to be a good time. So, yeah, Tom, my kind of gamer. Fanstyle writes, what is the name of the new card game that's being released by the Star Realms people? I've been trying to look up information on it, but can't seem to find it. It's epic or epic fantasy or something like that. When I was there, I was gonna shoot a little bit of video, but they asked me not to, which is a little strange. You know, in this day and age, people are pretty open about their prototypes and such. But I mean, it's their brand, they have to protect it how they see fit. So I didn't share that footage. Um, I can't really tell you a whole lot about it. It looks kind of like Star Realms, but it's not quite. I mean, there's four factions. It, it has some similarities in the sense that I believe it's going to be a deck builder that's easy to learn and play, but I, it's gonna have a few more keywords and I think some uh, 
you know, cards will have multiple uses, which will be interesting. And again, the setting is, is fantasy rather than, than space opera. Ken Charger Nimotony. How luck-based is the combat in Forbidden Stars? Well, I mean, there is luck. You roll dice at the beginning of combat, but that is based on the number of units you have. So if you want to improve your odds, make sure you go into a fight with a, a large force and keep your forces defensible by keeping them in, in bigger groups if you want to try to mitigate some of that luck. But after you roll the dice at the beginning of combat, that's it for rolling dice for the most part. Then you have three rounds of card play that go back and forth between you and your opponent. And you can play cards from your hand that will add to your dice results, trigger from them, give you special abilities. And beyond that, one of the actions you can take, one of the core actions in the game outside of combat is to upgrade the combat cards that you have. So again, if you want to mitigate the randomness, put better things in your deck. So yes, there's drama in dice rolling there, but I wouldn't say it's just a luck fest. Dusty Urker also had some questions about Forbidden Star. How similar to StarCraft is it? Well, I can't really say. I didn't play the original StarCraft game, although I seem to be hearing like from Tom and other people who are familiar with both games that yes, there are some similarities, but the similarities might be a little overstated if you think of it simply as StarCraft 2.0. His second question, what is your favorite parts of Forbidden Stars? I just like how unique everyone's faction is. I mean, I have my own unique models. Uh, the stats for the units are different. My combat cards are unique. My upgrades for my combats are unique. My event cards are unique. The, the modular board is double-sided. We can build the board before we play the game. Where we place the objectives, you can, I think you can do it randomly, uh, but you can also have it so that I'm placing where your objectives go, you put where mine go. So all of that's gonna change the game in, in drastic ways every time you sit down to play. There's dice, the components are all like gorgeous looking. Okay, I have to be careful, I don't review games, this is starting to sound like a review. That's not what, I, that's not what I'm intending to do here. Um, I mean, you have to judge for yourself whether or not this, this game would be a, a style and fit that you would like. But those elements of the gameplay I, I did uh, appreciate. Okay, I'm gonna move along here. Um, number three, would you play Forbidden Star with your kids? Is it that simple? <sighs> would and could are two different things. I mean. I believe Luke could play this game and understand the rules and, and do quite well, I'm sure. There are dice. Um, I don't know if I would. Like, I don't know if it would appeal. I don't think of it as a kid's game. Let's, let's just get that out of the way. This is a heavy, meaty game, and, and I'm not sure that it's really aimed at kids, both in terms of the content and in the complexity. But you could. A, a kid who was into games and had the interest, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. Number four, anything more you could tell me about Forbidden Star? Uh, maybe this actually ties into your question about, you know, could you teach to a kid? One of the things that was interesting was, despite how heavy the game is overall, I would say, by our second round, definitely into the third round, all of us, despite the fact we're in a noisy place where Anton is trying to teach this game to a gang of fools who are joking around and being goofy throughout his instructions, by the third round, I feel like we had a pretty good grasp on how to do things on our own. We weren't asking, Anton, what do I do? Can I do this? Can I do that? Anton was the, the fancy flight guy I mentioned earlier who does great dem demos. Um, uh, I felt like we all had a good handle on it. And I'm sure there'd be some like, little things that we maybe didn't have perfect, but uh, I, was, I was impressed with how intuitive all of the many moving parts of the game felt once you played a round or two. Dean Liggett writes, how long did it take Vassal to stop crying after you crushed him in Forbidden Stars? <laughs> As you saw earlier in the video, Tom took it like a champ. And to his credit, we didn't actually play a full game, although it was certainly going in my favor. Um, and listen, every game, every game I played with him at Cool Mini or Not, outside of Arcadia Quest, he absolutely stomped me in. So I was due to have a win against him. Number two, Dean asks, did Pep not attend because of border crossing issues? He looks shady. Actually, I think he'd be a blast to hang with and tear up Las Vegas. He does a great job on the videos. Well, I'll tell you something. He thanks you for that kind comment. Carl Tum, Tum, Tuminello. Here's kind of an obvious question. What, if anything, at Gamma did you see that made you say, oh yes, when this is released, this is going on the show? Well, I will say I did see things like that, but I don't like to pre-announce anything because things can change in the schedule and I don't want people anticipating something that then never happens. But certainly I did see some things that I penciled in as, as potential games to feature.
Any day 1009 asks, you and the Dice Tower are my two favorite board gaming channels. Well, thank you. Uh, did you get to play any games with them, and are you thinking of maybe having them on your show or vice versa? Well, by now you've heard the reports that we did uh, play some games together, both at Gamma and at Cool Mini or Not Expo, and at BGG Con. So I've had a chance to play some games with Tom. And actually, he's appeared in, in one of the episodes uh, that we shot. If I remember, I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. We haven't got any specific plans to do crossover related projects, but when and if it makes sense, I'm sure we are both open to it. David Coenlin writes, Hi Rodney, what is the story behind your Twitter post of having a great night with a dice tower guys, and a chicken, and a cow, and a nail gun? <laughs> well David, I was being a bit silly there, and just trying to pique people's curiosity. Those were all elements of the Penn Teller show that we went and saw that evening. And now Dante has a video question that he sent in. Let's take a look. Hello Rodney and Watch It Played crew, this is Dante here. What are some innovations that you saw or, you know, something new that you saw that maybe you haven't seen in many games or board games or any strategy wise, something in that nature? It's just a simple question, one question, that's about it. Have fun! Dante, I wish my memory was better, or something, because I don't really remember anything being particularly innovative, but you have to keep in mind I didn't spend a great deal of time with any of these games that I was seeing, so I didn't have a chance to really have the innovation of any of these games kind of impress itself upon me. I think we're going to have to wait till these games hit the market and be able to judge for ourselves where we see or find the innovation. But thanks for the question, uh, and I want to thank all of you for your questions and for watching the gamma videos that are released and commenting on them. It was a great opportunity to be able to go. I really appreciated that chance, and I hope that I could spend the time there giving you an opportunity to kind of experience it vicariously through me, who is also sort of discovering it for the first time. So thanks for checking them out, and thanks for all of your questions here, and hopefully these answers were helpful. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.